one of the keys to being a successful communicator is to really get into the DNA of the business, to understand the business of the business. Join us as we talk with Professor Matt Regas, PhD, and Ron Culp, who's a fellow with PRSA. They are both on the public relations faculty at the College of Communication at DePaul University in Chicago, USA. We're going to cover a range of topics such as how young professionals need to expand their news diet and how that helps them. The importance of mid-career professionals understand financing sheets, quarterly reports, all of those things, and how senior leaders need to understand that they can't do it alone. So how do they foster business acumen and an understanding of the business among their team? We'll talk about entrepreneurial mindsets. We'll talk about intrapreneurial mindsets. And we will talk about having communications be part of the fundamental DNA of the business. Join us on the next episode of Building Brand Gravity. Thank you for joining the latest episode of Building Brand Gravity, where we talk about the key issues, trends, and topics that are top of mind among senior communicators, branding experts, and marketing professionals. I'm Steve Halsey, one of your hosts. Today's episode is called Building Business Acumen for PR Professionals from Entry Level to CCO. And I'm so excited today to have two of the preeminent minds in the industry, Professor Matthew Regis. PhD, Ron Culp, who's a fellow with PRSA and he's a professional in residence. Both are currently on the public relations faculty in the College of Communication at DePaul University. That's located in Chicago, USA, if you don't know that. And they're really helping develop that next generation of communication leaders. They're also both members of the Page Society. It's a community of the world's leading communicator who's focused on creating community among senior communicators to improve business and society. Matt and Ron, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here, Steve. Thanks for having us, Steve. Yeah, you two are uh, quite the dynamic duo and co-authors of several books. I'm sure many of our listeners have, uh, have read those at different points in time. Uh, business Acumen for Strategic Communicators, a primer. Uh, there's business essentials for strategic communicators, creating shared value for the organization and its stakeholders. You've also, if that wasn't enough, you co-edited Mastering Business and Strategic Communicators or for Strategic Communicators. So insights and advice for the C-suite of leading brands. So these books are used by a lot of uh, colleges and university classrooms. I can also tell you from an agency perspective, we use them for professional development at our agency in-house with clients. So you two are definitely on the leading edge of the profession. And we're here today to talk about, look, I've got a copy right here, Business Acumen for Strategic Communicators uh, Workbook, your latest work. Guys, maybe you could start by sharing a little bit of what inspired you to write this latest book. And to put it actually in a workbook format for communicators at various stages of their careers. The uh, whole idea of these business acumen books originated some 15 years ago when I joined the faculty at, at DePaul. Matt came into my office one day and said, what do you think about this idea that we're going to help improve the business acumen of students and young professionals? And before he finished the sentence, I said, I'm in. Well, little we know that there are four books later, we're now into the workbook. And the workbook, quite frankly, came out of discussions with academics and some agency heads and CCOs after the last book, Business Acumen, came out that, that they said, we need tools that will allow us to work with our teams to up their game in, with business acumen and business knowledge. And so we decided that maybe a workbook would be handy. At first we were doing a lot of workshops and we were you know, going around the country doing this on one-off occasions with corporations and, and other universities, but we just couldn't extend you know, our, our reach any further uh, by making 
more visits. So what we decided to do is time for a workbook that can really make this accessible to a broader audience. And and Professor Regis, what about what about from your standpoint? I mean, you're you're really deep in the classroom all the way through, like graduate programs. So, uh, so 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 why now? What 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 have you seen that that's that's really saying, hey, now is the time to not just double down based on your books, but like triple down, quadruple down on business acumen for comms. Yeah, you know the funny thing is, is we had we had the trilogy, and that was nice and easy. We had three of them. Then we went for four and we're like, is it a quartet if you've got four books? What is this? What is this called exactly? Um, I would just build upon, you know, what, what, what Ron said. This book is really about active learning, you know, and and uh, we've all heard that um, uh, that wise adage of, you know, give a person a fish, you feed them for a day, teach a person to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. And so. That is really this book, right, is to give you the hands-on learning experience so that you can actually then kind of fish for yourselves when it comes to corporate communications uh, content and uh, analysis. And that brings us that brings us to this uh, this latest work. Well, and what, what I think it, what I think is interesting is, you know, a lot of people that have gone through journalism, communications, PR that the joke is, hey, I went that route because I want to be creative and tell stories, but I don't want to get in. I don't want to do math. I don't want to get in numbers. I don't want to see spreadsheets. But you're saying, hey, actually, to be successful and to be more creative, you've got to understand the numbers. You've got to create the spreadsheet. You've got to understand those things that create value. So I guess over the next half hour or so, that's kind of where I want to put my questions with you guys is really, you know, understanding that foundational element that that business acumen isn't something that is a nice to have. I mean, it is a must have, you know, for any any communicator to have an impact. And so let's start by talking about the different stages of you, of, um, of people. So you think about students or entry level PR professionals. They need to develop this fundamental understanding of business acumen and business fluency. But, you know, to a, to a, to a young student, to a junior AE business acumen, and that can seem like a really like out there concept. So, so Ron, maybe you can talk a little bit about why is it important for those starting their careers to understand that business acumen is an essential skill for being a good communicator? Yeah, those starting out, especially in an agency environment, they're so busy doing tactical execution of events and projects and news releases and the like, that they don't have the opportunity necessarily to say, well, how does this translate into making the business successful? And it's when you can move into that space and, and have the business knowledge to communicate that, hey, you know, if we do this, maybe it's going to help us better communicate the message because we're now, as the person responsible for tactical execution of a project, we're looking at it from the perspective as how this is going to drive business. And that is what's been missing for years. When we talk to CCOs and agency heads in preparation for, I think, our second book, universally they came back in the old days, 10 years ago, uh, writing was the number one requirement desired by these folks for the staffs they hired. Well, writing is still very important, but it, today they're telling us and they're hiring people who have more strategic view and a higher business IQ because they know that good writers make good thinkers, but good thinkers also need to understand the business. Yeah, I think I think that is a, that is an important thing. And, and the way I think about it is everything ultimately has to ladder up to what is that business strategy? What is that business goal? Otherwise, you know, why are you doing that? And if you start 
with an understanding of what the business is trying to achieve, even how you think about KPIs becomes very different, right? Like you said, it becomes less tactical and, and really about how are we trying to, to correlate what we're doing to achieving those business outcomes. So, so Matt, from, from your perspective, when you're talking to your students about career trajectories, right? Because I mean, even at undergraduate and graduate, they're, they're thinking, Hey, you know, I want to be a senior leader at an agency someday. I want to be a CCO someday. So what specific skills do you talk to them about? What specific skills from the workbook can give early career professionals an edge and stand out in the job market? You know, it's, it's, it, it's interesting when you think about, and, and, uh, Ron knows this too from the classroom. When you think about Gen Z, you know, our, our current students now, what for the most part, undergrad and also and also some of our graduates, I would argue the entrepreneurial mindset is really critical. And that mindset can help you succeed in a in a you know a, a large agency or a mid-sized agency. But a lot of our students, you know, Steve, also want to uh they think they might want to work for a boutique agency or, or start their own thing um or freelance or have a side hustle. And so it's like, okay, great. We want to support you in that. But to do that, you've got to understand the dollars and cents. And you've got to understand the business of the business, whether it's at a large scale or a smaller scale. And I think we know that a lot of those principles are similar. Um, so I really think the um, the entrepreneurial mindset, you know, is is valuable whether you're in-house on a large, you know, comms team or you're in, you're an entrepreneur inside of an agency and you're developing new business and new practice areas and new um, solutions. And, and so I think that this new book, uh, again, helps you practice how to go fishing and how to learn these different pieces. And I would say from a tactical piece, it's almost like learning a chessboard, right? And so when you're a junior person, you know, you're focused on le learning how one piece generally trained moves on the chessboard. But there's a lot of value. And even as a younger person earlier in your career to understand that big picture of how all the pieces, you know, how, how the queen moves on the board and understand sort of that larger strategy, because you can then create more value. Um, that classic seek first to understand, to be understood. You know, there's a there's a lot of truth. Um, to that classic adage. Well, I, I like I like that concept of the chessboard and understanding the rules of the game. So you understand, even if where I'm at, I can only move this far. This is how everything is moving around me. And I'm not asking you guys to give away the secret sauce, but for some of those listening to our podcast who may be in the earlier stage of their career, can you can you just give a flair of of some of the exercises or some of the things in the workbook that that they can go through to help understand that chessboard and the rules of the game. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick things off. And, and I would say um, before you're even doing the exercises for a young professional, it's about expanding your news diet. So if you want to understand the language and thinking of business, you need to build habits to where you get exposed to the different terminology and the different concepts. And so um, knowing about pop culture and sports and hopefully public affairs, it's always going to be really important, but also carve out time to where you're uh, reading something like WSJ.com uh, or CNBC.com or a business insider. Um, and that's going to give you then foundationally as you dive into then the exercises, that's going to then build familiarity, I think, and, and, and curiosity, Ron. Yeah, I think that I think that's interesting. Expanding your news uh, diet, but but even expanding um, where you want to create news, right? And and th this feels like it was ten years ago, but it was probably like three years ago. I think one of the most interesting examples was I found myself racing my son son home on a Sunday morning because DJ Marshmallow was going to drop his new album in Fortnite, and you know, for me, just thinking. Oh my gosh, from a truly omni-channel communications profession, per, uh, perspective, 
I mean, to think that how I'm going to drop an album is I'm going to create a concert in a virtual game that people can create avatars. And it was, it was, it was amazing way to think differently, but that was achieving a very good business uh, objective. So I want to transition a little bit to thinking about, uh, and I'm going to kick this back to you, Ron, thinking about kind of taking that transition from tactical to strategic, right? So when we're getting to a little bit more of our mid-level PR professionals, you know, they're trying to think about how do I translate some of these tactical outputs? How do I become more of a strategic advisor role? I mean, they're, they're, most cases aren't going to be working directly with the C-suite, but they're going to be working with senior managers of business, senior managers of communications. If you're in-house, that's when you really start seeing a lot of the inner organizational connection starting to come in. So maybe you can, you can address for us for mid-level professionals who are often just moving into those managerial roles, how does business acumen help them start contributing more strategically to their organizations? Yeah, you know, for the junior um, staff member, I, I think the big thing that we as their managers need to do is to let them know, you know, the okay, do you understand why we're doing this project? Very often we give them an assignment, they take it, they're like order takers, they salute and leave and come back and give us something. And we're then scratching our heads as their managers saying, this really doesn't hit what we're trying to do. And we don't take the time to say, let me tell you why we're initiating it at this moment, what the goals are for the business, and really bring them in to more knowledge about how what we're doing helps drive results for the company. And when you strike that, you've struck gold with not only the junior talent, but the mid-level talent that is often in the same boat. But I think a lot of times, especially junior talent, because they're doing so many other things, especially in an agency that may be working with seven or eight clients, that they feel it's too overwhelming. So what we have to do is break it, as we have in the book, break it into segments that make it comfortable for them if they just start out with something like, what is the bottom line? We hear it all the time, but we also know that a lot of young people say, I have no idea what they mean when they say that. That's something that's said between my boss and peers of his or hers. So we have to make sure that we make it comfortable for them. And then the senior leaders have to make sure that their mid-level talent is really getting up to speed with these terms. We did an agency workshop um, recently where the person in charge of the program said, oh, we don't have to go into all those details. I know my team knows this information. So Matt says to me, what do you think? Do you think they really know it? I said, I don't think they do. Just based on my own personal experience at both corporate and agency jobs. So we took a risk and we kind of ignored the, the, the direction and we started with the basics. Wouldn't you know that when we surveyed the group, they didn't know the things that their boss thought bosses thought they should know. So it's all making it as approachable as could be. And to bring people inside the tent, if you're a senior person and you have all that information, how do you share it? And how do you make sure that your team understands how that business is in business and how they make money and how this all translates into success for the enterprise? Yeah, I think that's I think that's really important how you tie everything together and they can understand sequentially how it fits together. And and uh, Matt, in, in our discussions, you know, you've talked a lot in the past about the importance of building those relationships across departments. But part of that is critical is having the critical skill set to be able to have the conversation with finance, to have the conversation with operations, to have that conversation with legal. So maybe you can share a little bit, uh, like what insights do you have for when people get to that mid-level, 
what are the things they need to think about in creating those connections and even the language they choose to not just demonstrate the basics, but demonstrate more of a fluency in uh, business acumen? Yeah, you know what? That's a that's a great question, Steve. And actually, that's in part what inspired our edited book, our Mastering Business for Strategic Communicators, which is really about um, its its current or former CCOs explaining then how they work effectively, collaborate across different departments and functions, whether that be legal, HR, uh, corporate corporate strategy, finance, and then. Um, and then we have sidebars, which uh, was a fair amount of work to put together, as Rod remembers. Then, you know, the CFO or CHO is then CHRO is sharing their experience of how comms adds value or doesn't or could do uh, better. So I think maybe a starting point is um, uh, mid-career folks being very intentional about not staying uh, within our traditional lanes you know, of who we might naturally interface the most with, particularly as a mid-level uh, professional. But consciously, you know, I've reminded by a, a great example, uh, a friend a friend of ours, I think you know Lisa Hartenberger uh, as well, Stephen. She shared an example when she was with Navistar, you know, for many years. So industrial transportation company. And she talked about purposely she would park you know, there's there's the office in the front and the white collar workers, and then you've got your production and your engineers in the back. And she would purposely enter every day from the back of the factory and go through so she'd have opportunities to build relationships with frontline uh, employees, right? And got out so that she can help them look around corners and see what is really – and build that trust and uh, – and uh, relationships. And so I think that intentionality of actually consciously getting out of your classic rhythm that's easy to stay within, particularly within large organizations, and actually start figuring out who are the folks that have what I, uh, what Ron and I think of as hearts of teachers, right? That are, we've, we've met these people, they do exist in all of these different functions that you can get comfortable with then bouncing ideas off of them and they they're not just dismissive right but they've got that heart of teachers hey i want to run something by you uh what do you think about this or particularly like financial or accounting concepts and that you can bounce things back and forth because our goal a lot of times is to take complex stuff and make it relatable and understandable but it's very hard to do so as we know when we don't fully understand what we're um uh, communicating. So I think that intentionality of always networking, building relationships, finding those hearts of teacher pros and other functions outside of comms is critical. Yeah. I mean, that, that intentionality, I think is key. I love that example that you shared of, you know, coming in from the back of the factory. And I would also, you know, recommend to any of our communications leaders out there, any opportunity you have, uh, particularly for your mid-level, to let them go out and do some ride along with your sales team. You know, I was fortunate um, earlier in my career with a number of clients to actually get out in the field and do ride alongs and actually see how the discussions happen. And like we said, there's a lot of complexity that needs to be boiled down, but understanding what that sales environment is like, what that, what the view of the brand is like, how you need to uh, like, get that communications to the appropriate level, I think is, is key. So, so, so some great advice there. Now, Ron, I want to turn a little bit, you guys spent a lot of time in the book talking about understanding quarterly earnings and financial statements. Um, so as we think about those in like the mid career level, when it, when this starts really seeming to make a little bit more sense, when they're starting to get a little bit more access to the C-suite, what, what advice or, um, what counsel do you have regarding um, financial reports and quarterly earnings calls for those in the mid-level? I, I can start out by saying, don't do it the way I did. You know, I spent the first first uh, 12 years of my career as a reporter and then working in the government in New York. And quite frankly, unfortunately, business essentials weren't part of either of those jobs. 
So when I joined Eli Lilly and Company, I was there maybe two weeks and my boss comes in and says, oh, the person who usually does the earnings release has just gone over to another company, Merck. And so we need somebody to write the report. So go up and meet with the CFO. So I go up with my reporter's notebook, which I was still carrying, and I'm taking notes furiously. I have no idea what he's saying. And I come back, I come back and I said, I think I'm in trouble. And, and so my boss said, what do you need to know? And I said, like, what are earnings? And I was serious. So he, tra he traipses me over to the director of, of investor relations who takes me under his wing. Bob Graper is forever my hero. And we take it from the top. And he is my tutor on everything regarding earnings releases. I learned so much in that experience. And even though I probably went through 24 drafts, back then we were A through, we, we did the alphabet. We started with A and if we're lucky by Z, we have a final draft of the release. So we finished the release, sent it to the, CF, the CFO and the CEO for approval, not because of what I did, but because I was a communicator and I listened well to Bob Graper from Investor Relations. We put together a darn good earnings release and it was a career changer. Next thing you know, the CEO says, you know, the guy who left also had responsibility for the annual report. So let's give the new kid the annual report. Now I'm in deeper than I ever thought I could be. That was a career defining moment. It appeared on my resume. It also was a job responsibility for every role corporate role I had after leaving Lilly, because it jumps off the page as something that if you understand the business of the business and you can do an annual report and an earnings release, then you understand the business. And like I said, it was a defining moment. It'll be the defining moment for other mid-career people who want to find ways and one of those ways of doing it is raise your hand and say, could I sit in on one of the sessions where the guy writing the press release on earnings is talking to management about how, how it's put together? And then, of course, listen to the earnings calls. You learn so much through that. Again, first time I've ever listened to an earnings call was the one I was asked to put together after that, that press release. So... Hands hands on is nothing like it. That was definite definitely trial by fire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I thought for me what was 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 interesting was um, uh, for for a large public company I wrote their annual report for a number of years, and what I found interesting about it when you think about uh, where things sit in the corporate world was my ID badge was sponsored by the CFO. So like when we were scouting locations and places to shoot, um, you know, the images and everything that we we're going to do to bring the theme to life, it became a joke when I would travel with senior managers to see what rooms I could access that they couldn't. And the fact that I could access rooms because I was sponsored by the CFO that, uh, you know, uh, leaders in the company couldn't was was really speaks to the importance of understanding uh, that that. The, the language of it, but then also as, as Matt, as we talked about, is having those connections. So, so let's then switch to senior stage career, right? You've got that seat at the table. You're a CCO, you're a senior agency head, counseling on the earnings reports, um, all of these type of things. How does business acumen change at that point and how does it allow what, what's required to be seen as more of an equal partner? I mean, you guys have interviewed a ton of CCOs. Where does it where does it pivot? Where does it change once that CCO is has that seat at the table and wants to be that partner in the decision making? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's so interesting, right? Because we continue to see now surveys. Speaking, you were talking about CFO just now, Steve, of, of reporting structures. And um, 
you know, for a while it was do large corporations have CCOs. Okay, we're established there. Now it is CCO taking on additional roles and responsibilities. We're calling that CCO plus. And so now we're at this point where we've got the seat at the table and it's like, okay, CCO and comps team, what are you going to do with it? Because the other thing that we all know, um, I, you know, this conversation also takes part with investor relations officers. They all feel they deserve a seat at the table. There's, there's this uh, mushrooming of C-level positions, and they can't all sit around happily around that table. And so I think we're at this interesting phase of what do we now do really as counselor and advisor to demonstrate our value and our worth to, to, to live up to uh, this elevated role for our function. And, you know, I think one thing that Ron and I have seen is our function talks a lot about whether it's agency or in-house about learning and development of our teams. But then when you look at the data, it's not as encouraging always of how much we are truly spending to help level up, not just, you know, the top person, that's great, but the success of the top person, a lot of it's going to rest on the quality of their team and the skill set and knowledge of their team to help support them as a counselor and advisor. And so I think every everyone listening today, I would challenge them that you're actually doubling down on your learning and development uh, programs and giving you know, we talked earlier in this call about the junior folks and the mid-level folks. Make sure that you're investing in them um, and not just giving lip service, but you're putting real dollars and cents behind opportunities to help them grow so they can help you uh, be more successful in your roles as senior leaders. So, Ron, how about fr from your perspective, having sat at some of those senior most uh, most positions, uh, how did that kind of influence what you wanted to talk about in this book? for those senior communications leaders just to make sure they're they're thinking about key topics key issues key training for their staff yeah i i think it really struck me in the last couple of corporate jobs where the ceo actually anoints you you are responsible for this because very often it's not said they assume and some CCOs automatically move in. Many of them now have MBAs and other uh, experience that that equip them to have a seat at the table and be considered a business leader. Well, the rest of us had to kind of earn that seat. And then the light bulbs went off when I learned that I can't do it alone. I've got this big team, big corporate team of people and I need to break this down and make sure that there is somebody assigned to every major business unit who understands the business of that business. And all of a sudden, the business unit heads were coming to me and saying, can you free up time for Jan or Paula or, or Ted to sit in on my weekly meetings? because we as an organization value his input and he's going to learn or she's going to learn more from having been there. So all of a sudden we moved some of the mid-career talent into what I consider pretty senior roles with some very big sizable business units. And the business unit head was happy that they had somebody who was really in communications and understood what they were trying to achieve. And then that trickled down to the people then that they came back and they had to say to the junior staff, here's what we need to do and why. So it was game changing for organizations all over the country to realize that I just can't keep it to myself and that I aren't I good that I am the in the turn to a person for every major strategic business decision. Spread that knowledge and you become more successful through what your team is doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that is that is great advice. Matt, I'm going to give you this nice, easy softball question around acronyms ESG and DEI. <laughs> 
you guys in your book, you delve into ESG and DEI reporting. And as we know, it is changing. It almost seems like daily, you know, from, uh, you know, I would say, you know, being somebody based here in New York, you know, from the municipal level to the county level, to the state level, to the federal level, to, you know, you have the EU looking at, uh, you know, multiple changes in ESG and materiality assessment and sustainability and all of that. And then you also have the cultural overlay. So you've got like regulatory reporting, you've got cultural overlay. You guys delve into that in the book. What advice do you have? And can you talk a little bit about how communicators need to think about ESG and DEI reporting um, in a world that's in heavy flux on these areas? And in a world where I don't really see people running away from the activities more so than the terms. So the nice, easy one for you, Matt. I, I, I thought this was an easy one, Steve. Like as you were... As you were unpacking it, I'm like, hmm. Um, no, seriously, it's it's uh, it's an excellent question, and it couldn't be more in the moment right now, right? So, um, uh, you know, it, it seems like each week now we're seeing a different company in, in different ways. Let's say uh, adapt to what they're what they're going to at least publicly do around DEI. Uh, and ESG. You know, it's interesting. I think many listeners, and I think the three of us are familiar with, survey data of the American public shows, like you said, the actual acronyms DEI and ESG, uh, perhaps lower levels of support than when actually specifically programs are explained. Do you support sustainability? Do you support diversity? Here's how we're doing so as an organization. We know that that gets higher levels of uh, support, and we know that some organizations seem to think the solution to that is we're not going to call it ESG, we're going to call it sustainability, or we're going to call it um, impact. Whatever that solution, whatever that decision might be, we do know that as communicators, uh, our job is going to be to really explain these programs and the specifics of them and to tie it increasingly what we're seeing to uh, the business and business outcomes and business benefits, even if I think all of us would agree that it's the right thing to do, right, to support DEI and ESG. But in the larger, uh, the larger world that we are operating in, I think sociopolitically, many of us can agree then if we're a financially oriented stakeholder, if we can see how these things help ladder up and support superior business and financial outcomes, that would seem to be to be less disputable and something that um, wherever we might fall on the political spectrum that we could uh, get behind. And so I think that this has made it, I think the communicator and the comms function even more important when it comes to navigating, as we know, a very, uh, uh, complex landscape around DEI and ESG. Yeah, and I and I think as as you know as, as you talk about that and kind of what I see out there, you know, it's very much about like you said, how do we connect it to the business, who we are, what is the authentic purpose of your enterprise, and I think with that, if you start with that as the foundation, then how you tell that story and the metrics you use to tell that story. I think that's when you get that authentic level of things. I think part of the challenge um, and, and, you know, it was a conversation I had with a senior CCO um, a couple of years ago who was basically saying, you know, what issues and topics do you have the right to really talk about that you're credible talking about? It's not saying you don't value all these things, but what are those things that as a company, does it make sense for you to report on? to talk about and how does that tie ultimately from what we're talking about here? What is that business strategy? What is that business acumen? So, you know, Professor Regis, you, you made me think of something I didn't think about before, but that ability to translate your ESG or your DEI initiative reporting results 
is in itself a form of business acumen that's that's really critical for professionals to develop overall and then within the ecosystem of their respective companies and and brands. So, you know, things are not static, right? And we and and even since since um, you know, you guys wrote this book, you know, there's little things, a few elections happening in the world, all of these things mean that what we have to do is be continuous learners, right? And that business acumen isn't something, hey, I take a course, I get the check mark, I am good to go because there's always new regulations, there's always new pressure, there's different Supreme Court regulations if they're in the U.S. There's all these things that factor. So, Ron, you you talk a lot about personal growth and like legacy, so when you think about business acumen as something that evolves over time, what advice do you have to communicators and what challenge do you have to them to continually develop their skill set no matter where they sit? Well, I, I think, um, you know, if you look at it as newcomers, the, the young people starting out in the profession, I don't want them to become overwhelmed at the thought because it seems far more complicated. Even if you look at our glossary, almost 600 terms, that that there are probably about 30 that they really need to know about. So I, I want them to figure out how they can know the businesses they're working for and, and how business overall might operate. So I usually start out by saying, if you do nothing else, pull up the front page of the Wall Street Journal read the left-hand column, what's news, and just scan it. And you will find out what is going on within the company. I had one CEO that constantly challenged me in meetings where he'd say, well, did you see that, what, what the news was here about Pfizer today? And I was a deer in headlights. Well, I knew what he was doing. He was reading the Wall Street Journal because he had the luxury of having a driver and I didn't. Uh, but so I got up earlier and I read the What's News column and then I went to the, the index in the journal and, and the Times and I read what is being said about my company and or our competition. So you always stay on top of the news. Pretty easy to do. When you come to a term then that you don't understand, circle it. And I guarantee you it's in our in our glossary. Look it up. We have a simple explanation of what that term is, so you can learn. It's, it's sort of by osmosis. So does that be for the newcomers? Then in the mid-career level, we kind of touched on it earlier. I say network, 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 and I don't mean externally looking for a new job. I mean internally with the organization, people who are making the business happen, the finance team, the legal team, and others. And You'll be surprised if you ask them to go to coffee or somebody at your peer level within that organization, the word of mouth spreads that this is a different kind of communicator. He or she's really interested in our business. So I, I kept getting invited to staff meetings um, and I didn't have time, but I went because I learned so much about what was going on. And then I was able to share a communi communications perspective that often was not realized. So the midterm, the mid-career people really need to just get involved in the organization and, and, and really become a business partner at whatever level that they're permitted to rise to. And then CCOs, they just need to train their teams to be true business partners. And it's kind of an overwhelming thought. And we hope that's what the book kind of addresses. And it's certainly our workshops and the feedback we've gotten over the years has been positive to the fact that, gee, we thought they knew more than they knew because they did deliver what I needed, but they had no idea how much pain was involved in getting there. And so the more you help your team understand how business operates and the expectations of business on the communications team. That, that's kind of the whole package of what a leader can do to bring everyone up in the organization to have a greater knowledge. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that that idea that you're talking about of being a true business partner, a true business advisor is is key. Uh, Professor Regis, I'm going to give you kind of the, the closing opportunity here. Ron just talked about the need to get into the DNA of the business. That's my term, not not his. But you basically want to get in the DNA of that business. You were talking about expanding your news diet. Um, similar to what Ron was saying, you can't do it yourself. You talked about intentionality. You talked about an entrepreneurial mindset. You talked about a uh, intrapreneurial mindset within within a corporation. So, from your standpoint, what what advice do you have for our listeners other than go out and buy the book and do the workshop? What what it, what it, what advice do you have uh, for everybody in terms of just really pulling through this business acumen and being a better business partner, a better strategic communicator. Well, you know, you know what, um, and Ron and I have had this conversation many times. Um, we are in one of the best businesses in the world in communication because if you're a curious person that um, I don't have in this office, but I have in another office a uh, curious George uh, and, I, and I think that that's the right mindset to always be curious and continual learning. And Ron and I are spoiled a bit, Steve, that we actually get paid to learn and to help others learn. And that's one of the most rewarding things that keeps me and I know Ron charged up uh, and keeps us doing these books, you know, four books in, in, in 10 years. Um, and so I think if you can embrace this, and we're going to have to in the, in the, in the years ahead, uh, be open to what we don't know and don't be afraid of that and embrace kind of that unknown. And, and we're in that AI revolution right now. And I, and I just installed Gemini into my G suite and I'm trying to figure out what does this mean? <laughs> what can I, what can I do with this? And, and, and honestly, I, I resisted that for a little bit because it's easy to get set into your ways and not want to change processes and ways of thinking. Um, but whether it's a topic like business acumen or data and analytics or DEI or AI, um, as long as we embrace curiosity and lifelong learning and being open to what we don't know and wanting to keep having that explorer mentality, um, this is one of the best fields that you could possibly be in. Um, and we do now have that seat at the table and we can affect serious change, but we've got to be intellectually curious and truly embrace being OK that we don't know, but we're going to explore and figure it out. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I mean, the, this this industry is anything but um, expected and stayed and it's constantly evolving, which is which is what I think is so exciting. And, and also, I think, as we talk about here um, and, and as you talk about everything in your book about the business acumen, where things come in, is really understanding, like you said, that curiosity for data, for context, for strategy, for relationships. Those are all fair, four very key things for individuals to bring together. And then, like you said, we can't be static. We can't allow our, ourselves to do that. We've always got to be learning and kind of tying it back to, you know, the, the theme of this podcast, Building Brand Gravity. I'm a firm believer that everything we do either attracts somebody to our brand or repels them from our brand. So let's get smart. Let's do those things and make sure we're pulling people to our brands in the right way. So Professor Regis, uh, Ron, thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, for all our listeners, I want to make sure you follow them on LinkedIn. They always have uh, great things to say and perspectives. You can also buy individual copies of this. I've got mine right here. Business Acumen for Strategic Communicators, the workbook on Amazon. Or um, if you're looking for a bulk order for your classroom or for your team, you can reach out to Matt or Ron directly or their publisher, Emerald Publishing. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. So much sage advice. Um, and for all our listeners, tune in next time for our next episode of Building Brand Gravity. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Steve. A pleasure. Steve, thanks for being a friend of uh, this journey for so long now. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, guys.